Welcome to Prime Nine, the countdown show that covers the very best in baseball. Guaranteed to start arguments, not end them. This week, it's the best players at each of the nine positions in the 1980s. Why nine? Well, that's baseball. Nine players, nine innings, Prime Nine. With so many great players, how did we pick our all 1980s team? Real in the left field corner, put the extra bases. Well, obviously, we look for the very best player at each position during that time span. Oh, what a play. Oh, is he something else? He takes a strike. He stood there like the house by the side of the road and watched that one go by. And we didn't just look for the three best outfielders from the 1980s. They had to be the best in left, in center, and in right. He leaps and makes the catch. You should also know that they didn't have to play the entire decade to qualify as the best. But we did give a little extra weight to those who did. Line to left field, base hit. Does that mean stars like Kirby Puckett and Doc Gooden, who only played some of the 80s, did not make the list? Well, you'll see. We begin with number nine in your scorebook on Prime Nine. It was in right field in Fenway Park with a glove and arm of this man forged a reputation before the decade even began. Even before the 80s, I mean, he was the best right fielder. He leaps and makes the catch on the warning track. What a catch. Being known as a defensive player, I loved that. I worked hard at it and won eight gold gloves. Five of them in the 80s where his natural instincts and rifle of an arm became his calling card. Evans to the plate, he is out at the plate. When you talk about Dwight Evans, you're talking about not only a, a great thrower, but he was accurate. From right field in Boston to third base in Boston, long throw. It was a great weapon for the Sox to have. <laughs> Good arm, he's a cannon, man. He ranks one of the top right field arms in the game that I've ever seen. Evans was a defensive star from the get-go. His offense, on the other hand, took some time to take off. We really turned around early 80s, 80, 81. Became a tremendous hitter in the second half of his career. Evans rips the card left field. High she goes, and see you later, baby. Grand slam. No right fielder in the 80s had more total bases, home runs, RBIs, and runs scored than Dwight Evans. In fact, some of those numbers were better than most players at any position on the diamond. And no one knew that better than the pitchers. He's definitely one of the most dangerous guys that I've ever faced. There's a ball that makes high it up. Gone, home run, Dwight Evans. When we talk about the greatest hitters of the game, I think they all have one thing in common. Those are the guys that know the strike zone, work the strike zone, and use it to their advantage. And that's what Dewey was like at the end of his career, especially. Evans with his 300th home run of his major league career. You look around the league and you say, who would you want more than him? And there weren't very many guys that you would say, I like better than Dwight Evans. He was just a gifted guy. He still is. Makes me mad. Guy's like, you know, 58 years old. He looks like he's 25. Thank you, Dan. That's the nicest thing you've ever said about me. <laughs> Del Murphy could do everything on the field to beat you. He could hit a, a two-run homer to the opposite field. There it goes! Way back! And Atlanta leads! He could make a diving catch. What a play by Murphy! He could steal bases. He was a 30-30 guy. And he gets a stolen base. It's just amazing how good Dale Murphy is. Murphy, to me, he was the ultimate player. And a 1-0. One run, drill, left center field. It's going to be in for a base hit. Dale Murphy. It was always a joy to watch him hit because he was one of the few big men that hit the ball all over the field. I have never seen a guy who could hit to all field with such power consistently. He hit it up the middle, hit the left, hit the right field. High and deep to right field. This could be number 300, and it is. There was nothing you could throw him that he just would not just murder. How far to do it? With such a productive bat, it might be easy to overlook Murph's fielding, but he was deceptively fast and collected five gold gloves in the 80s. He also got a lot of votes for the Midsummer Classic. Dale Murphy. And made seven all-star appearances in the decade. He was also the first National League outfielder to win back-to-back -back MVP awards. 
Murph was not only a gold glover in center field, but won the MVP in 82 and 83. With all the talent that was in the, the major leagues at that time, that said a lot about Dale Murphy and his consistency in the game of baseball and the way he played it every day. It was just one of those things where the team was playing well, I felt good about my game, and things gelled. He was one of my all-time favorites. And yes, Murphy also beat me out for an MVP award. He's one of our favorites, too, at number eight, an all-time great. Welcome back to Prime Nine, featuring the all-1980s team position by position. We've covered the outfield in right and center. Now it's on to left, or number seven. Today, I'm the greatest of all time. Thank you. It was clear from an early age that barring injury, Ricky would be the all-time stolen base leader. He was only 21 in 1980, Ricky's first full season in the majors, when he caught everyone's attention by stealing a major league best 100 bases, breaking Ty Cobb's AL record. He's in there. Just two years later, he defied belief. He was about as unstoppable in 1982 as anybody in the history of baseball on the bases. That was the year he set the single season mark with 130 steals. Just the thought of 130 stolen bases, that's more than a whole team. There goes Ricky, there he goes. It seemed like I was running every time they blinked. He goes again. And he kept going and going, leading the league in steals every year in the 80s, but one. You know, I remember Ricky Henderson, his productive years is just looking up while I'm going to the bat rack and he's on second base again, or he's on third, he's in scoring position again. It could give you a one nothing lead quicker than anybody in the history of the game. That's right, he topped that list too. In 1985, Ricky scored 146 runs, the most in the decade. That same year, he became the first player ever with 80 steals and 20 home runs. And his 403 on base percentage in the 80s was the second best in the majors. He's the best leadoff hitter of all time, uh, without a doubt. No argument here. Ricky owns the all-time record for home runs to lead off a game with 81. And he hit 39 of them in the 80s. Ricky would walk to the plate. He'd already be in scoring position because he had power, because he could hit a home run. Uh, he can hit a double, or he can take that walk and turn it into a double or triple. And he draws the walk. His 962 walks were also the most in the 80s. Throw in his steals and runs scored, and you had the most dynamic player of the decade. One he topped off is the 89 LCS MVP. And that was just the 80s. It was a catch me if you can game for his entire career and nobody could catch the guy. He was, he was unbelievable. Just like Ricky, our all 80 shortstop is in the record book for a seemingly unbreakable feat. Cal Ripken Jr. has reached and his story too began in a prior decade. There was no streak then. You know, this is the early 80s. Um, it was another five, six years before people were talking about it. But there was lots to talk about in 82 when this fresh-faced rookie saw his dream come true. I was always an Oriole fan, and I've always wanted to be an Oriole. As far as a baseball player, I, I couldn't imagine myself being anything but an Oriole. And Cal made quite an impact winning Rookie of the Year honors while taking the short out of shortstop. Up to that point, shortstops were 5'9", 160, agile. He came in, it blew that stereotype out of the water. Holy cow, what a play for a big man, that was great. Making things look easy, which was uh, sort of my style, but I took great pride in kind of knowing where the ball would be hit. He got him, what a play by Cal. Five times he led American League shortstops and assists, and four times topped the list in double plays and putouts. Up the middle, Cal Ripken gets him. But it wasn't just fielding that sent Cal to seven straight All-Star games in the eighties. Shortstop at that time was really a position of catch the ball and really don't worry about hitting too much. Cal Ripken brought that offensive mindset to the position. A point Cal drove home in his first rookie year at bats. Ripken with a tremendous home run. I think I'll hit my share of home runs. I, don't, I can't say 20, 25. I, I, I can just say I'll hit, I'll hit more of my share. And he certainly did. 204 home runs in the 80s, the most by any big league shortstop, a rank he also held in five other offensive categories. So he'll always be known as the premier offensive player that could win MVP batting third in the lineup. 
Cal did that too, becoming the first player ever to win Rookie of the Year and Most Valuable Player Honors in back-to-back -back seasons. This guy did a lot of things on the field, and it was just Cal's uh, edict that I'm just doing my job. I'm just going to go out there every day, do the best I can. And he meant every day. Cal began his journey on May 30th, 1982. By the end of the decade, it was clear that he was baseball's Iron Man. A thousand consecutive games. It's just uh, a little bit of luck and a lot of desire. Desire, dedication, and durability. That's our All-80 Shortstop. Welcome back to Prime 9, featuring the All-1980s team. Dewey Evans is our right fielder, followed by Dale Murphy in center. Next came Ricky Henderson in left, and at shortstop, the Iron Man, Cal Ripken Jr., which means it's time for third base, number five. If you're building a team and you want to start with third baseman, it's Mike Schmidt that's the guy that you want. It is out of here, Michael Jack Schmidt. Not a bad choice. After all, no one in the majors had more home runs in the 80s than Schmidt's 313. That's a home run for Schmidt. He has hit four straight. I think the man was hitting out of turn. Every time I come in the pitch, he was, he was like a third hitter up or something like that. It is out of here. Michael Schmidt. He seemed to hurt you at your most vulnerable moment, especially with the game on the line. Long drive. It's all over. Mike Schmidt with a home run. Phillies win it. You didn't want to let him beat you. Don't make a mistake. If you make a mistake out over the plate, he's going to take you deep. Mike kicked off the 80s with a career best 48 home runs and led the National League five times in the decade. Mike was also quite the fielder. He could make some plays over there at third. He made some plays look easy. Oh, what a play by Schmidt! A lot of people don't give him a lot of credit for his defense. This man was a hell of a defensive player. Schmidt won six gold gloves in the 80s. What a grab by Schmidt! Unbelievable! And helped the Phillies win their first World Series in 1980. That was also the year Mike won his first of three MVP awards, including one in 86 at the age of 36. It was a rewarding year for me in a sense that it kind of revived my career and allowed me to have that year and one more very productive year. And it was in 1987 that Schmidt reached a cherished milestone. When he retired in 89, baseball fans realized they had not only seen the best third baseman of the 80s, but perhaps the best of all time. Ryan Sandberg has done just about everything you can think of on the baseball field. Ryan Sandberg was as good a middle infielder as you were going to find. And that's why you'll find him right here as our second baseman on the all 80s team. Defensively, uh, the gold gloves speak for themselves. Sandberg won a gold glove every year from 1983 through 89. But fielding was just one of his specialties. And Lionel makes the play. The National League MVP in 1984 brought a powerful dimension to second base with his bat. He made it tough for other second basemen because he could hit for power. In a left center field and deep, this is a tie ball game. What I saw, he was the best second baseman ever because I think he hit four home runs off me. Oh! He hits the deep left center. Look out. Do you believe it? It's gone. Sandberg, in the Cubs' last at bat, has twice delivered a game tying home run. And there was plenty more to Rhino than just power and defense. This guy, his base stealing and base running was, I mean, it was unbelievable. He was probably one of the fastest guys in the league. And Sandberg will score. Oh, Lee Toledo. How many second basemen can hit 19 homers, steal 32 bases, and rank at or around the top of the league in hits, average, doubles, triples, slugging percentage, and run scored? He was the total package. There was probably a three, four year section of the 80s where if he wasn't the best player in the game, he was certainly in the top five. And he had six straight all-star appearances to prove it. He wasn't flashy and he wasn't flamboyant, but you would certainly love to have Ryan Sandberg on your team for 10 years. Ryan Sandberg! Holy cow! 
it wasn't Don Mattingly was a great player during the mid-80s. It was Donnie Baseball. High and deep to right field. Mattingly with an upper deck home run. And there was a stretch for, what, five or six years? Was there really a, a better hitter in a game than, than Mattingly? There she goes. Mattingly with an upper deck home run. It was a six-year run from 84 through 89 when Mattingly excelled at the game like few others. Every time he came up, you expected him to get a hit. I mean, he, he was a hit machine, uh, and that's the bottom line. Mattingly led all first basemen in the 80s in both batting average and slugging percentage. We were able to come up and be you know, fairly successful early. Everything I did, I was trying to win a game. Love the ball up. I mean, he just, he tomahawked that pitch. There it goes. You could not throw a fastball by him. That was never more evident than in 87, when Mattingly tied a major league record. Holy cow, he did it! A home run in eight consecutive games. Mattingly is unbelievable! And when he came up with the bases loaded that year, well, talk about clutch. A new Major League single season record for Mattingly, six grand slams. And his 145 RBIs in 85 were the most by anyone in the decade. Have we mentioned his fielding? Not only was he a great hitter, God was unbelievable at first base. Human vacuum cleaner, he didn't miss anything. What a play by Mattingly, holy cow, they get a double play. How about that play? Mattingly went on to win five straight gold gloves in the 80s. He was the complete package, a bat with pop, and hands as soft as butter. The guy was always working, he was a workaholic. He knew that there was always something to basically help get that extra advantage. The approach that I took was that, I, you know, I gotta get better every year. Gotta keep getting better, gotta keep getting better. Well, no first baseman was better than Donnie Baseball was in the 80s. Manningly brought more to the game than just the numbers, and his numbers were real good. I tell you, he's unbelievable. We now return to Prime Nine, where this week we're featuring the nine greatest players in the 1980s, position by position. Some of these guys are no-brainers, while others just barely made the cut, leaving plenty of room for debate. So now it's time for number one and two, the greatest battery the 1980s had to offer. We begin behind the plate with number two. Throughout the 80s, Gary Carter was rock solid for the Expos and Mets. Out of here, Gary Carter! Without a doubt, he was the, you know, he was the best catcher in the National League. And we think the Majors, which puts the kid on our all 80s team. They called him the kid because of how excited he was about the game of baseball. That's the, the way he played the game, like a kid, his whole career, had fun. He'd always talk at the plate, always. You know, games going on right in the middle of World Series. How was, you know, how was your year? How you doing, kid? This and that. I'm like, I really don't want to talk, Gary. I got to face Dwight Gooden and David Cohen. It's kind of tough. But you can't just talk your way into the prime nine. Gary wanted to be the best at his position. Uh, that's what really drove him. Defensively, he was every bit as good as the best in the in the, in the game. Carter, he was a gold glove type catcher every single year. He earned three of those gold gloves in the 80s. But he was also a guy that could hit in the heart of the order. You had all of those defensive attributes, and he was in the four hole being required to drive in runs. And did he ever. Gary led the league with 106 RBIs in 84, and led all major league catchers in both RBIs and hits in the decade. Carter puts his game out of he was a guy that you just hope didn't come up in a clutch situation at the end of the game because he was one of the best clutch hitters I ever played against. This ball game may be over, folks. It is. Gary Carter wins it for the Mets. The kid became a fixture at the Midsummer Classic. Brian! I started eight All-Star games from 81 through 88, so I was very proud of that. And more often than not, he performed like an All-Star. Well hit! It seemed like every All-Star game that we played in together, he came up with a big hit. 
The game's most valuable player award is presented by Commissioner Kuhn to Gary Carter, who joined Steve Garvey as the only players ever to win it twice. Throw in five Silver Slugger awards, Hall of Fame credentials, and a World Series title, and you've got your best catcher in the U.S. Jack Morris, in my mind, was the dominant pitcher in the 1980s. Morris might be best known for his amazing 10-inning shutout in Game 7 of the 91 World Series. But it was the decade prior when Jack was at his peak. Jack's just a workhorse, throw out a lot of innings, and uh, you know, give you a good performance 90% of the time. Morris threw more innings than any other pitcher in the 80s. And no surprise, he also had the most wins. He was consistently at 95 with his fastball, with really good movement. Morris just blew him away. He had that good fastball and that excellent split finger. That was nasty. He was as tough as pitcher as there was in the league. But he never pitched to statistics. He pitched to win games. I didn't care about earn run average. If we won 12 to 11, I was just as happy as 2 to 1. I just wanted to be on the field when the game ended to shake hands with my teammates. That's something else Jack did more than anyone in the decade as he threw 133 complete games. The man was going to go out there and he's going to throw nine innings and that was it. I wanted the ball. I went out to the mound every time I went out there with one thing in mind, to win the game and to finish the game. Strike three call and the ball game is over. When he took the mound, you're like, we're going to win today. It was just an attitude. An attitude that can be summed up in one word. Competitor. 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 He was the most competitive guy, and he just refused to lose. He could smell a finish line better than anybody. He smells the victory, and he comes down hard. He wanted to beat you, and he wanted to outpitch you. Jack won 19 games in 1984, including one for the books. Got him swinging, and he has his no-hitter. He then went 3-0 in the playoffs to lead the Tigers to their first World Series title in 16 years. No pitcher in the 1980s did it better than Morris. Jack Morris goes all the way. Before we turn the calendar on our 1980s team, you should know that it wasn't easy to pick our prime nine. That was especially true on the left side of the infield. Just consider the men who didn't make the team at shortstop, Ozzie Smith and Robin Yount, a pair of Hall of Famers. <laughs> And imagine having to tell the man with the decade's highest batting average, Wade Boggs or George Brett, sorry, fellas, you didn't make the team. Look at this. Brett is out. And the team is mad. Hey, you'd be mad, too. That's our prime nine. What's yours?